The science of refeeds and diet breaks. Firstly, what the fuck is a diet break? And what is the difference between a diet break, a refeed, and a cheat day? People often use these terms interchangeably, which creates some confusion because they are not technically the same thing. First off, cheat meals or cheat days are garbage. I've talked about this before. Typically, people put a cheat meal or cheat day label on it when they eat a food that they normally abstain from eating, like it's an extra marital affair on your diet. Someone doesn't normally eat pizza, but they fancy eating a pizza, so they call it a cheat day to make themselves feel better. It can be clouded with unnecessary feelings of food guilt and can also flirt dangerously close to binge eating behavior. A refeed isn't a free pass to eat foods that you normally cut out of your diet. It is a strategic increase in food, primarily from carbohydrate. One of the theories behind refeeds stems primarily from a hormone called leptin. This is a multifaceted hormone that plays a role in appetite and body weight regulation. When you lose weight, leptin levels can decrease, which may make Make dieting harder. And many studies show this. For example, this study looked at female fitness competitors leading up to and post contest. And around contest time, you can see that their leptin levels plummeted through the floor. It has also been shown that if you inject people with leptin, some of the negative side effects from dieting could be overcome. Therefore, strategies to raise leptin levels could help decrease the likelihood of weight regain. What is that I hear? Ben, I clicked on this video to learn about refeeds and diet breaks, and you're talking about injecting pharmaceuticals. What the hell, professor? But hold your horses, we are getting to it. It has also been shown that temporary overfeeding can raise leptin levels. If you put people through short-term studies where they overfeed and then underfeed, leptin levels go up when they overfeed and go down again when they underfeed. On top of that, it has also been shown that overfeeding in carbohydrates can raise leptin levels, whereas overfeeding fats does not. Hence the idea that interspersing high carbohydrate days into your diet could possibly, maybe, probably overcome some of the negative side effects of dieting. Small problem number one, overfeeding for three days resulted in an increase in energy expenditure of only 7%. In short, you would have to eat a lot more calories to increase your metabolic rate by only a little bit more, which kind of feels like pushing and pulling at the same time. Small problem number two, if you overfeed to raise leptin levels, when you go back into your diet, leptin levels will transition back towards baseline. The impact is unfortunately very short lived. You can't just eat a couple of high carb meals and be like, oh, brand new metabolism, who dis? So we know that short term overfeeding isn't super duper powerful for raising your metabolism relative to how many calories you're consuming. But there could be more to refeeds than leptin. If you're dieting, perhaps the extra carbohydrate could have a beneficial impact on muscle glycogen and gym performance, which could maybe then have an impact on lean body mass retention. But the thing is, up until this point, this is all hypothetical. We have short term research measuring things like leptin levels in response to overfeeding, but what we really want is research that looks at actual body composition changes over time. Enter a paper from 2020. Group one dieted like normal, 25% energy deficit every day. Group two had the same weekly energy deficit, but they were in a deeper deficit for five days and then had two days where they increased calorie intake through carbohydrates. It turns out that the group refeeding didn't lose more fat mass, but they did hold on to more lean body mass. And refeeding also seemed to help preserve resting metabolic rate. Tremendous. Although later some people questioned the statistical methods, they did still conclude that refeeding was better are holding on to dry fat free mass. Whew. So now that backstory is all out of the way, let's move on to diet breaks. The premise behind these is similar, but they tend to be longer than refeeds. Enter the very cool sounding Matador trial. This compared one group dieting for a straight 16 weeks and another group who had the same 16 week period interspersed with diet breaks. E.g. two weeks dieting, two weeks not dieting, two weeks dieting, two weeks not dieting, etc. And fuck me sideways. It worked. The group interspersing diet breaks lost more body weight and more fat mass, and they preserved their resting metabolic rate to a greater degree. Which of course is absolutely spiffing. But this does come with the downside. If you were a fitness competitor planning a 16 week diet and you wanted to implement this protocol, you would have to start dieting at 30 weeks out, not 16. Which begs the question, what would happen if you changed the ratio of dieting to diet breaks? And thankfully, as of now, we now have a new research paper on diet breaks. And it has another super cool name, the ice cap trial. And I have personally been nursing a little bit of a science semi over this ever since I saw the protocol published. Instead of a two week diet, two 
two-week diet break design like we saw in the Matador trial, they opted for three weeks of dieting for every one week of diet break. So what were the conclusions? Changes in fat mass and fat-free mass were similar between groups. Also, no differences in muscle strength or endurance, no difference in resting energy expenditure, sleep or eating disorder behaviours. The diet break group did, however, benefit from lower hunger and desire to eat scores. So what can we conclude from all this? Research on diet breaks is mixed. At best, they promote greater fat loss and greater preservation of resting energy expenditure, as shown when doing two weeks of dieting, two weeks of diet breaks. One possible mechanism for the greater fat loss is simply the idea that it was easier to adhere to a calorie deficit, which, whilst not magical, isn't something to be scoffed at. At worst, they are no better for fat loss, no better for preserving resting energy expenditure, but they might be better for regulating appetite. And whilst this isn't as exciting, regulating hunger is of course very important. The question is, whether it's important enough to extend the overall diet duration. And if you made it to the end of all this nerdiness, give yourself a pat on the back.